pound. Yeah, health and safety at work act of 1974. Okay, is this act? This is the reason why we're here. Okay, um, this is what governs or drives the compliance uh, within the construction industry. Okay, and what is broken down into various regulations. Okay. And it is these regulations, like PPE regulations, like COSH, money handling, working at height, um, like um, working at height, redor, and all these regulations that drive um, compliance. So there are various types or kinds of regulations that are relevant on a construction site. But what is going to come in your exam is who is responsible for making sure these regulations are followed? There are three or four categories of people that you need to remember, okay? Uh, the first category of a person you need to remember is the health and safety executive, okay? Does anybody know, is it quite warm in here? It's fine, yeah? Does anybody know the roles of, uh, not the roles, who the health and safety executives are? Anybody remember? Who is the health and safety executive? From the government. From the government. Okay. These guys are employed by the government. Okay. They oversee the health and safety aspects on all construction sites in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Okay. That is. Yes. Is it yeah. Yes, it is. They can take a seat there. Hello. Um, okay, what are you going to do for me? You're going to write on that um, as I uh, okay. So this guy has got specific roles and responsibilities he does that will come in the exam as far as making sure this regulation is on the site. Then you also have the employer. The employer sometimes is reported as site manager or manager or supervisor. Okay. This guy also has particular roles and responsibilities they have to do to make sure the regulations are followed. Okay. Then you have the courts. They also have a small part that they play. And then you also have you, the operative, or we put the operative right here. You also have particular roles that you play to make sure these regulations are followed. And this is the start of this whole course, okay? Um, for example, the health and safety executive, they are responsible for making sure that these regulations are enforced. So you have the enforcement, okay? And in doing the enforcement, they can issue either a prohibition notice, or an improvement notice. It's either prohibition or improvement, okay? Do we know what a prohibition notice is? We've had it this time before. Has anybody actually ever seen a prohibition notice in action being issued? Sorry? No, you haven't. But does anybody know what a prohibition notice is? Yes. That's when they close the site. Under what circumstances do you think the site would be shut down? If it's not safe. If it is not safe. Okay. Sorry? It's not safe to work there. It's not safe to work there. And what are some of those things that would render it unsafe? What does not being safe mean? What are some of the examples? Risk of injury, arm. Sorry? Risk of injury, arm. Um, yeah, but there's going to be risks everywhere. It's going to be risks every day. Yeah, what sorry? Facilities? 
Poor facilities. Would that make a site shut down, really? Last thing, yeah. By the time a site that has invested millions is told to shut down, something so, so serious is going on. Yeah? So I want us to think through. Just imagine a construction site. They probably have work in progress. They burnt billions in there. And they say to them, unfortunately, you can't open another day because of breach of regulations. But what does that look like in reality? Just, just imagine, how bad can it get? What would cause that? Accident. An accident. A bad accident. But accidents do happen. It's the course of life. So does that mean that every site owner is literally um, petrified at the site of an accident? In the circumstances where, for example, an accident happened and nobody reported and both side companies and employee can, can get, you know, in court and risk penalties as well and they can shut down for this reason. Yeah, I mean, you have a point, accidents, that is all correct, but by the time they shut down a site, they have investigated and considered that the practices over time are so bad or violating mm -hmm. regulations and it is no longer safe for operatives and everybody else to continue working on that site. The, the key here is that it is no longer safe. It's like, um, it's like something that's toxic. It's very unsafe. Uh, either the practices are unsafe um, there are so many accidents, people have died in the process, property has been damaged, and then they can shut down a the site. They can also shut down a site if they have issued notices of improvement and these are being ignored. You know, it is just like by the time bailiffs come on your door, there have been letters, phone calls, phone calls, letters everything to give someone an opportunity at least to take responsibility of their outstandings. If by the time those guys come, it is the last resort. So that is what a prohibition notice does. It's the last resort. Okay? An improvement notice is issued by the health and safety executive where a construction site has been deemed to have areas of improvement concerning how they um, how they um, fulfill these regulations. For example, it could be that they need to buy the PPE, uh, site maintenance equipment, uh, they need to do update their risk assessments, um, they, they need to make sure they are vigorous in checking whether their operatives have got the necessary requirements to work safely. So they can be issued with an improvement notice. Okay? And that's a big part of what the HSE does. HSE stands for Health and Safety Executive. The second thing that this HSE is going to do is they're going to do inspections. Site inspections. Sites are inspected in the event of an accident or um, an, an, an injury or sites are in, in, in inspected um, when they have just started in operation, they can be inspected and they can also be inspected routinely, uh, what we call sport checks, as part and parcel of making sure that the regulations are followed. And the third thing <coughs> that the HSE do is that they update these regulations. So when they get reports of accidents, when they get reports of incidents, and everything that is surrounding the trends of um, what is happening within the industry, they can make judgment on what regulations to introduce or to update based on their findings. Um, for example, nowadays we have a lot of emphasis on moving plants. The reason why we have a lot of emphasis on moving plant is because 
over time, there have been more accidents and incidents uh, involving moving plant on site. Now we've got traffic marshal courses, we've got banks passing courses, um, uh, CPCS is A73, we've got a whole section uh, on um, working safely around plant. These have been updated as time has progressed after finding that there are more accidents and incidents in that area. Okay? The HSE have that as their responsibility. You realize the responsibility of the HSE does not cross into the responsibility of the employer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Everybody sticks to their lane. Yeah? Just like in, in athletics, you know, when they stand on track, everybody stands in their lane. But they're all running for a prize, but everybody sticks to their lane. Okay, it's the same thing here. Okay, let's look at the site manager or employer. Oh, by the way, you'll get questions here, either in your CSP or the other one. The employer does a couple of things to make sure that the regulations are followed. They will issue you your PPE, okay? We'll do the risk assessments, method statement, and incidents reporting. Okay? So they will do, amongst other things, these are the key ones, and we're going to tackle them either individually as we go along. Okay? One of the questions you will get in the exam will be, who is responsible for making sure that all operatives have got their PPE on site. Whose responsibility is it? It is the employer. Okay. Now, the employer is the same thing as the site manager. It's the same thing as the supervisor. Okay. Um, so some questions might have who is responsible for making sure you've got PPE on site. And instead of having employer, it's got supervisor and other areas in the multiple choice. So those all mean the same thing, okay? Um, I've been in this very situation where I'm teaching a class and the students tell me to get our own PPE because some subcontractors or some sites kind of like want to cut corners <coughs> and um, it becomes the responsibility of the uh, employee. But under the law, the employer does that, okay? <coughs> The employer also is the one who writes the risk assessment. As an employee, you never write a risk assessment. So if you find that in the multiple choices anywhere, should I switch the C uh, SC on? It's become warm. I think it's getting warm now. Once it comes on, I'll take down to the windows, get the windows down. Okay? Risk assessments are done by the employer. We're going to look at that in in, in detail, um, this the employer as well writes the method statement. Okay, who knows what a method statement is? Because you're going to get that in your level one exam, whether you like it or not. Sorry, it is how a job gets done safely, the step by step process of doing the job safely. Okay, that is akin to a manual when you buy a wardrobe from Ikea and it shows you the tools you need to use and how to do a job safely. That's what um, a method statement is, how to do a job safely. It's going to come in many ways by the coming exam, method statement, okay? Who knows what a toolbox top is? Yes, sir. Like they are like a tool from the Pacific, um, um, say, not so, yeah. Sorry? It's basically like a tool from the Pacific, uh, yeah. subject that you're trying to learn. Correct. Yeah. 
It's a short presentation on a specific health and safety topic. Right? That is what a toolbox talk is. Um, toolbox talks are not every day, but periodically they are given by your employer, your site manager, and toolbox talks are you know, specific safety topics, for example, if there is a change in regulation, uh, if there is uh, an introduction of a new set of tools, uh, if there is an incident or an accident that has happened on another site, uh, that they feel you need to learn about toolbox stocks that is by the employer or site manager. All this is done to make sure that these regulations are followed as a means of compliance. Okay? What we're doing now is also part and parcel of making sure regulations are followed. I think I can now close this. Um, How is it mandatory? Because if something happens and there is evidence that it was not introduced during the induction as a breach of regulations, so the employer makes sure the inductions are done and then welfare facilities. It's interesting that health and safety regulations are evolved so much that the site can be shut down if it doesn't have welfare facilities. That is a breach of regulations. And this actually struggles across uh, the entirety um, of uh, not just construction, but the UK. So if I open up a company and we are an estate agent, and in my office there are no toilets, my uh, staff have got to cross the road and go to the next bar, you know, I, I can be in breach of the concept of regulations and I can be shut down. So welfare facilities include somewhere you can have warm water or uh, cold water make a cup of coffee or tea and toilet facilities and somewhere people can sit down. So if you walked into the center and you can't have anywhere to sit down, you've got to go outside because you can't sit down. That's a breach of regulation. Okay? It may not be enough for everybody, but it has got to be something. Okay? And then the last thing, um, but by no means this, is accidents and incidents. Okay? <coughs> The employer. Uh, well, excuse me, we'll go back to the induction. What did you say about the induction? Again? The induction is what is done. Oh, and thank you very much for that. If I'm moving too quickly, please interrupt me. Inductions are what every employer is mandated to do. This is when they introduce new operatives to the organization. During the induction is when um, you are introduced to the site regulations. They are site tours for some, you get to know the restricted areas, uh, you get to know where your welfare facilities are, you get to know the health and safety practices, um, you get to be issued PPE during some inductions, and um, you also um, introduced to um, things like your supervisors and your work streams, and your credentials are checked, whether you have your green card, uh, where they have the right to work. All that happens during an induction. Every organization should do an induction. And what happens after an induction? In some inductions, there's some basic training that is given, depending on what the site is responsible for. And what happens during the induction as well is that after the induction exercise, you're going to sign somewhere that you've undertaken induction, especially in construction. Okay. Has anybody ever been on an induction in construction? So, before? 
GitHub. Okay, so that anything I looked up. Fire assembly points. Yeah. All right. Set to rules. Set to rules. Yeah. Set to rules. Set to rules. Rules. Um, fire on all points. Then smoking after, area. Sorry. Smoking area. Smoking area. Yes. Yes, it happens. Um, and then you and sometimes you're introduced to a few people um, that you're going to be working closely with, either your supervisor and stuff like that. And then you sign at the end of the induction, and that all the things that you have been through, you have understood. Okay? Why do you think that signing is important? It puts a legal responsibility on you. It puts a legal responsibility on you, and also it covers the manager. Bless them, sometimes they mess up, but they are always like, in, in case things go wrong, the employer didn't do this for them. So they also need to cover themselves because at some point you've got to take responsibility for your actions, especially if you've been given the tools uh, to operate. So that's what is involved in inductions. Okay? Let me talk a little bit in detail about accidents and incidents because there are quite a few questions in your level one that will come uh, to do with accidents and incidents. First and foremost, the employer makes sure that there is an accident and incident book or where you record accidents from an incident on site. He makes sure that that is there. And I'm sure that during the induction, there is talk of accidents and incidents and what we need to do in case they are. Okay? According to the regulations, this accident reporting is very important very important. It's almost like close to pedantic. But why it is important is because if it isn't reported, <coughs> something similar can happen in the next 10 minutes and it costs lives. But once it is reported, response is taken immediately. So that's why they encourage operatives, in, even if it's just a card, write it down. I cut my blood when I was using this. Okay? Because what the site managers do is to go back and review if this is something that could repeat again or that could happen again and could be more dangerous. So that is why it is very important to report accidents. Now, you realize the statement I made. You write the accident or injury the accident book. That is if you're not too severely injured or you've not lost consciousness, okay? You write what has happened as an employee. You write in the accident book. Or some sites have actually been told, you report to the office and the site manager does the writing. You report it, okay? And every site should have an accident book. Now, under a specific regulation that I'm going to talk about here, it's called RIDO. Okay. And it goes for reporting of injuries diseases and dangerous occurrence regulation. Under this regulation, it is a 2013 regulation. All site managers or employers are required by law to report certain accidents and injuries or diseases to the HSE. Okay? And these categories is where there are deaths as a result of an accident on site, not because your employee went on holiday and they were involved in a car crash. That is nothing to do with working on site. But if they've been working on site, they've fallen through a scaffolding, for example, and they have cracked the right side of their roof. Okay? That 
that has got to be reported under RIDO to the Health and Safety Executive. So deaths, um, severe injuries, for example, limbs have been broken and people have spent a long time out from work. Diseases, yeah, because certain materials have been used, a couple of the number of your employees have now gotten particular diseases, then the manager will have to report this under RIDO and report to the health and safety executive. So under RIDO, managers or employers report to HSE. This is under RIDO. They report to HSE and what they report is these types of deaths, accidents, severe injuries, diseases. Okay? For example, if there's an outbreak of Wales disease and three of your staff, if you're a manager, have not reported to work, the manager then, under RIDO, will report this to the HSE. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that will count in your level one. I've seen it come a number of times. Whereas, you as an operative, you write down in the accident book, should you be involved in any sort of accident, but it is not too dangerous or not too severe for you not to carry on one. For example, you slipped, you fell, you feel fine, you can carry on, you just fell. You write that down, okay? Or, for example, you were uh, using an equipment and you kind of like cut your, the part of your hand. Yes, you went to the first aid box, just put a plaster on, cover your gloves, carry on working, you report that. Or it could be a near miss. Just as you passed by, you know, a pallet of bricks just fell down and crashed right at the spot you took your foot off. So you're going to report a near miss as though you're reporting an accident in the accident book. Okay? That's the subtle difference. Okay? And there are questions that highlight these differences. Okay? Now I'm going to take this off and I also discuss what responsibilities the operative has got. Do I have any questions so far? I tend to move slowly in this area because there's quite a bit to cover and that is all relevant, okay? Okay, let's crop on. The other thing that the operative does is, one, you make sure that you do your training just like you did now. It's the duty of the operative to make sure that they are fit for purpose. You got your training, you got your green card, they are out of sight. Okay? That's the number one thing they do. And also the operative is going to make sure that they report in the accident and incident book. Okay? Among other things. Okay? That's what this training is part of what we call the accepted uh, code of practice. Okay? A C O P, accepted code of practice. Things like method statement is an approved, uh, not accepted, approved code of practice. Method statement, the training, for example, CSCS, these are approved code of practice, right? Things like part testing, okay? Um, something appliance testing, okay? Is this our approved code of practice? They are not necessarily required by law, but then you can't get anywhere without doing them, okay? So you do your training and you report your accidents and incidents in the accident book, okay? There is one question I've seen in the past. I don't think the NOCN set this exam, but it might come in the CSCS, where the courts have a responsibility to issue fines okay, that are unlimited or an uh, imprisonment sentence up to about two years. Okay? And that is the maximum jail sentence. Now, that could change depending on how regulations change. 
Okay? And under what circumstances do courts get involved? Do we know? But yeah, if it is severe consequences, but how do they get involved? Because that will help us understand why we even have the courts here. Yes. With the health and safety that you can tell the court. Correct. Spot on. When this guy comes on a site and they have issued a prohibition notice, the site is too bad, and they give the site managers reasons why they've shut them down, because they've got to sit them down and tell them, you know, over the last six months, you've lost 10 operatives, and those lives could have been saved if your site was safe. You've breached this regulation, you've breached that regulation. We are shutting you down. It doesn't stop there. Because of the breach of regulation, they take this company to court, right? It's just like the Road Traffic Act, for example. It has got specific regulation. Somebody is being caught by the uh, Road Traffic Police. They do not have insurance, don't have MOT, um, they are over speeding, and you know, there is evidence that it's not the first time. They will arrest this person who is driving, and they will probably take away the license, okay? But because this person has breached regulation, they will then take them to court themselves. When they take them to court, then the court, on the premise of what they have been told by the HSC on that evidence, they can decide this guy is not going to drive again for the next three years, or this guy is going to serve um, 200 hours of community service. It all depends. Does that make sense? The health and safety executive will introduce the process of the courts. They take the companies to court, and the courts make the decisions on what action is to be taken. Okay? There is a question that I know that has this relationship. Okay? And this introduction will actually give us a basis upon which we will then start looking at the likes of risk assessment. Now, I'm going to be looking at this particular area in detail, okay? Because all I'm looking at is risk assessments, but this introduction comes in your CSCS, but also in your level one. So let's look at risk assessments in detail, what is involved. Okay, I'm going to wrap this all up. Any questions at this stage? I'll keep on using the statement, this will come in your exam. I know that method statement will come in your exam. I know that for sure, um, amongst other things. And the enforcements that are done by the HSC also tends to come in the exam. So let's look at risk assessment. Tomorrow is a big game, Chelsea and Liverpool. I support neither. Next one, I um, Do any of you guys love football? Mm -hmm. Yeah, any sport. Sport Chelsea. Ah! Uh, thank God I didn't say nasty stuff about Chelsea. Mm -hmm. You remember that player called Eden Hazard? Yeah, we have Pulisic. Hmm? We have Pulisic. Yeah, but when Hazard was in the Premier League, he was a Hazard. Because mm -hmm. we're going to talk about Hazard. Yeah? Um, but when he went to Spain, he was not a hazard. He never caused any harm or injury to anybody. That's interesting. Right, what is a hazard? I'll just give you the answer. You think policy is better? Anything that can cause harm. Yeah. Anything that can cause harm or injury. Okay? Anything with the potential. cause harm or injury, okay? Anything with the potential to cause harm or injury, that is a hazard, okay? Now, before I move on, I want us to break down what hazards look like on a construction site, okay? From your experience, 
if anything, that can cause harm, or the potential cause harm or injury the hazard. So what are some of the examples of hazards in sight? Chemicals. Where do we find so, chemicals? Um, because they can't just be chemicals on site. Nobody uses chemicals. But where do we find chemicals? In cement. In cement. So materials are hazards. That goes yeah? Because in majority of the materials are chemicals. What else is a hazard? Okay. Sorry? Asbestos. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it. Asbestos. Asbestos. That's material. What else? But what exactly can cause injury? Working out there, uh, what? Uh, yeah, I know working from mics, but what, what can cause injury? Falling down. A ladder can cause injury, for example. If you get the definition, I'm looking for your understanding of the definition. So anything that can cause harm and injury. So a ladder can cause harm and injury. Yes. Something about blocking your work. The safety material about blocking your work. So, um, obstructions in the walkway, okay? What else can cause harm? Working with vehicles. Vehicles, yes. What's tools. Tools, brilliant, yes. What's wrong with tools? Poor storage of materials yeah. can cause harm or injury, okay? What else? Doing the task without the right PPE. Yeah, but that, what, what will cause harm? I'm hearing, but what will cause harm? I'll give you an example. Um, that chair you're sitting on can cause an injury. No? Yes. That desk can cause an injury. Yeah? I'm talking about stuff, anything. Yeah? Can cause an injury. That guy in front of you can cause an injury. Do you know how? He can just decide to slip backwards with his chair, run straight into you. It's caused you an injury. So anything that can cause an injury. Let's go to a construction site. Picture it in your mind and start stripping it down. What could injure you? Bricks. Bricks, materials. Yes? Tools. Tools could injure you. Correct. Vehicles could injure you. A ladder could injure you. A scaffolding could injure you. Okay? Mobile plant could injure you. Right? What else? Spillages. Yeah? You could slip. What else could cause harm or injury? Because if we don't break it down, vehicles unloading. Vehicles unloading. Now we're talking. If we don't break it down, I'll have wasted the next three hours. Because once someone doesn't understand this, everything else I'm going to say will be just guesswork. That's why I don't mind spending all day here. Because once you do this, even if they come and tell us now, shut down, they go and sit the exams, I'm confident that I have a chance. Because this is the principle, this is the backbone of this whole thing. Hazards, risks, risk assessment. That's the name of the game. Yeah? The rest is simply just installation. So, what can cause harm? You have highlighted them. Sorry? How's the, how's the stuff from fumes? So, dust and fumes. Okay? That can cause harm or injury. Uneven ground. Site, yeah, for vehicles they can overturn, right? How about your colleague? Violence. Sorry? Violence. Um, violence is a scenario, but your colleague can cause harm or injury, especially if they are under the influence yeah. of either alcohol or they are, they are on some medication that is impairing their judgment, they can cause you harm or injury. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so your colleague can cause harm or injury. So those are examples of hazard. Typically, when you look at it, almost everything on site is a hazard. That's what I was looking for. Just like life, almost everywhere is a hazard. When you're crossing the road, someone can just decide to violate the traffic lights. They can just decide to um, abuse the zebra cross. You know, vehicles are hazards. People are hazards. They've got a lot on their mind behind the wheels. There's plenty of hazards, okay? I've spent a lot of time talking about a hazard. What is the risk there? What is the risk? Anything that 
Dr. Abdul Kalam said? Um, well, hazards lead to accidents. That is a hazard. What is a risk? A risk is the chance, chance, high or low, probability, chance, high or low, probability, uh, likelihood that the hazard will chance high or low probability likelihood that the hazard will cause harm or injury. Okay? I just described that the chairs are sitting on the tables, the people will cause harm or injury. But the chances are high or low. Chances are very low if there are controls to make sure that these hazards don't cause harm or injury. Okay? It's just like you've got a very uh, boisterous, loud, barking dog. If you put a muslin around its mouth, you reduce the chance of it causing harm. So what is the risk that that dog is going to attack you? 40% because it's got a muslin and the dog lead. But if you remove the muslin and the dog lead, then the chances are high that that dog would attack you. Does that make sense? The hazard never goes away. But the risk increases or reduces, depending on what measures you put in place. Does that make sense? Okay, the hazard on the road will not go away. The cars will still be there. Still be the same drivers, the same human beings, okay? And you could say, oh my God, I'm not gonna go out on the road because there's so many cars, I don't even know how I'm gonna cross the road. But the same hazards being there, you could decide that every driver needs to have a valid driving license, and you could decide that there is a pelican crossing, and you could also decide that the maximum speed limit is 20 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, you feel slightly safer to cross that road. The risks have now gone down. The same hazards we talked about are there, but the chance or likelihood has gone down. Does that make sense? A risk can also be looked at as a, an outcome, okay? So, uh, risk, for example, um, of working in areas that are extremely dusty is the risk is having lung-related illnesses, okay? So the chance of that outcome is the risk, okay? So that's the risk. And we're also gonna look at an accident you get one question or two that will ask you what an accident is, okay? I'll put this up here. Okay? An accident is an unplanned, uncontrolled event which has led to or could have led to injury to people, damaged or plant machinery or the environment and or some other loss. Something that is unplanned and has led to an injury, okay? And a near miss is an unplanned event that did not result in an injury but could have led to one. That's a near miss, okay? Very common question in your exam, which my third of the students get right, to be honest, is why it is important to report or record a near miss. You know it is important to report them because in the future it will be a real accident. Okay, so it's important to report it, right? And let's look at okay. That, that's the last slide that has that or those fun clapping in there. Okay, competence is a combination of training, skills, and experience and knowledge that a person has and their ability to apply them to perform a task safely. That is competence, okay? 
combination of training, skill, experience, and knowledge that a person has and their ability to apply them to perform a task safely. Okay? Um, let me ask a few questions before I proceed. No, actually, I'm going to finish this whole area first. What is the risk assessment then? Every exam, every week, this question is brought. Who does the risk assessment? Do you remember whose responsibility it is? It's the site manager. manager or the employer. Okay. And what is the risk assessment for that matter? We have plans to risk of the task and the the full of the happening. Sorry? It identifies the risk of the task and the likelihood foot of the happening and how to prevent Brilliant. Wow, you've got some very good answers down there. I like that. Identifies. Identifying. Identifies hazards. Okay? The process of identifying hazards and measures to reduce likelihood of injuries. Okay? Measures to reduce the likelihood of injuries or measures to reduce the consequences of the hazards. So risk assessment, what this guy does in a nutshell, the site manager, they know their site too well, they're going to break down everything that is a hazard. Break it down and categorize it. Okay? These hazards are high risk, these are low risk. And then they're going to write down all the controls to make sure those hazards don't harm people. And that is what they do. Uh, they plan that in advance before they allow people to come on site. Okay? With um, this new reality that we are having to deal with globally, companies and organizations have had to do risk assessments in line with COVID. In other words, this is the risk. Or these are the hazards. You know, people might come in and they are not aware they've got symptoms. They might not be aware and if they're going to be in a particular space, they either have to have masks, or you've got to have places where they can wash their hands, there's an awareness, some they do check temperatures. So that is those are the controls to reduce the consequences of the hazards. Does that make sense? So you know that they're going to be using plenty of um, materials with chemicals in them, for example. They're going to be using a lot of cement. You know that. So what are you going to put in place as the site manager? Okay, make sure that they have rubber gloves and rubber boots and goggles, okay? And make sure that we have a toolbox stock every week. Those are the controls to reduce the consequences of mixing wet cement. Does that make sense? So risk assessment, the key word you have to remember in your exam is identifies hazards, okay? Identification, that's the key word. And what needs to be done to reduce the consequences, okay? I've got something up there. Purpose of the risk assessment is again to identify what needs to be done to control health and safety risks. Key one is identify, okay? That's the risk assessment. I already shared what the method statement was. We know what a method statement is, don't we? Okay. And then risk assessment is required by law. And in your CSCS, the question that will be asked will be what is the minimum number of employees for which a risk assessment becomes mandatory? Five employees. So if you've got a construction company that is you, your brother, and your son. You could get a few small jobs and it will not be mandatory to have a risk assessment done. But once that grows to beyond the three of you, as long as it's five and above, then you're required by law 
as a site manager, whoever that manager is for that company, to have risk assessments in place. But that's a CSCS question, typically. Okay? Right. And lastly, in this area, I want us to um, learn about what a dynamic risk assessment is. Actually, in your mock exam, it's number 18. I think it's number 8, actually. Dynamic risk assessment. Have you heard of this term before? Dynamic risk assessment is the continuous. The keyword is continuous identification. Continuous identification of hazards. And then controls identifying hazards and what needs to be done to control health and safety risks. That is on a continuous basis. Why is it continuous? Dynamic risk assessments are done in the event particular sets of circumstances have changed, i.e. the weather has changed overnight, or um, the equipment has changed or the number of people that were had, had been assigned to do the task has either gone significantly down, um, then the manager has to uh, dynamically review that risk assessment as the job is being carried out. You know, you wake up in the morning and you realize actually severe weather a lot, but you've already set up the tower and the crane because you planned on the premise that the weather is manageable, okay? Um, the best example I can use is when all of a sudden, pretty much, um, there was an announcement that the way we're going to be doing work is going to change pretty much like in the next week uh, in terms of um, uh, lockdowns and isolations. So you can imagine um, sports events, theatres, they had to do dynamic risk assessments to manage the severe change of a variable that is going to, yes, the paper. Yes, you can. Yeah. So you can imagine those changes that were made. So dynamic risk assessments, the key one is continuous. Continuous. Oops. That's quite strong, isn't it? Uh, continuous identification of hazards. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, let's go through some questions. I don't know what you're talking about. The main purpose of the method statement is to. What's the main purpose of the method statement? A, to provide information for auditors. B, to describe the safe way to do a task. C, protect the employer from possible prosecution. And D, make sure that work can be carried out in all this. The safety way to do the task. The answer is B. To describe the safe way to do a task. Who has the main duty to make sure that risk assessments are carried out? The employer or the manager? Okay. Um, most major injuries in the construction industry result from A, electricity. B, slips and trips. C, fire and smoke. And D, being hit by moving the Slips and trips. Okay? Um, the number one category of uh, injuries in the construction industry uh, is falls from height. That's always the number one category. But in the multiple choice answers, where falls from height is not there, the second one is slips and trips. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is, is the whole, is both your test more? Yes. They're all multiple and choice. How do you, uh, the first one uh, for the N or CN is 25 questions. Are you going to be using uh, doing the N or CN as well? Is the one of the tests the 50 questions? Yes. Oh, I've done that one already. Okay, so you're doing just the I think one. I should do it. Okay. And 
Yeah, the second one, which is CSDS, is 50 questions. How many are, how many just the right out of our 50? 45. 45? Yes. It's easy. It's easy. Oh. It is. It's easy. It's easy. Sometimes common sense, sometimes regulation and circumstances. You will not get an opportunity to do a simulation of the model, the actual test. So on the computers you set up and go a simulation exams. So you do that 50 and you see how much you get to review your answers. Do it as many times as you can before you open the exam. That's part and parcel of our experience of being here. Most major injuries, that one? Yes, yes. Most major injuries in the construction industry result from A, electricity, B, slips and trips, C, fire and smoke, and D, being hit by moving vehicle. So the answer is slips and trips. Okay? An example of an accident is okay, A, an unstable scaffold, B, nails left on the floor, C, a worker cutting their arm, and D, breaking the side speed limit. C, a worker cutting their arm. Okay? What type of question? An example of an accident. What type of harm is most likely when using a hammer? A, an eye injury. B, hand arm vibration. C, skin rash or irritation. And D, bruised or crushed fingers. The answer is D. Yes. What type of harm is most likely when using a hammer? A, an eye injury. B, hand and vibration, C, skin rash or irritation, and D, bruised or crushed fingers. Oh, I did, I did, I did. Yes. Okay. That's his D. Okay, right. Let's look at, again, the category of risks. Second section that is likely to come in the exam, which is health hazards on site. An example is the risk of Wells disease. Yeah? Wells disease or leptospirosis. Okay? The hazard is what could potentially cause that. That's the hazard. So do we know what could potentially cause Wells disease? Right. Rats. Okay. Rats. What else? Chemicals. No. no. There are nothing like chemicals in Wells disease. Box. Oh no, uh rat urine. Rat urine. Yeah, that's why it's here. Yeah, sorry. Rats, rat urine. Um and water as well as mom. So contaminated. Water, broken sewers. Okay, sometimes here they use the word vermin, especially in the CSDS, they use the word vermin a lot. Okay, <coughs> site litter 
This invites the rocks. Broken sewers invite the rocks. Contaminated water as a result of the rat urine. They are all interrelated. So, the multiple choice answers to a question of this nature could have any of that. So, if you only thought rocks and rat urine was the only answer, there could be these answers in there, but because you've never seen them, you don't think you know the question. But that's why I break it down into every possible hazard that would cause well disease. In your CSCS, they will ask you what the symptoms of Wells disease are. You must have seen that in your practice sessions already, and they are flu-like symptoms. Okay. And what the control is here is site hygiene. Site hygiene. Okay. Because, because of the fact that rats have smelled any sense of food, either from broken sewers or any litter around the site, they will come on site and then they urinate on site. And if someone is eating something on site and not wash their hands, falls on the ground, they pick it up quickly, five second rule, they even expose themselves to the possibility of catching those disease. Whose symptoms are the like symptoms. Okay? So the control is high hygiene. Site manager inspects the site every end of day to pick out anything that could, you know, potentially. Uh, invite rats on site, or if there is water that is running from outside the site, then that can be investigated and dealt with. Okay, so that's number one, Wells disease. The second one that we're going to look at. Do you want more paper? Yes, I do have more paper. Who needs paper? Anybody else needs paper? second one that we're looking at here um, is what we call land related illnesses. For example, asthma. Okay? And what are the hazards? What could potentially lead to land related illnesses? Yes. Dust. Dust, yeah? yeah. Toxic fumes, that's also correct. So you've got dust. But even here, we're going to break it down into either silica dust or wood or saw dust. And sometimes toxic fumes, correct. Where do we find silica dust on site? That's a question that's very common. Yeah. Bricks, and Bricks and concrete. Yeah. That's where we find silica dust. Bricks and concrete. concrete. Okay. And sometimes silica dust could lead to a disease called silicosis. Again, this you will find in your CSCS. Okay. Silicosis from silica dust. Silica dust, bricks, and concrete. Okay? Now, what are the controls here? Okay? PPE. Some people need to get what they call FFP3 masks or masks with special filters or um, extractors placed on the equipment. What about wet cutting? Wet cutting is one of them. Okay. Ventilation is another. These are examples of some of the controls. The hazard still remains, but these controls reduce this risk. Okay. What's wet cutting? Wet cutting is where water is applied around the area that you're cutting. So instead of the dust rising, the 
because there is water down in the dust. That's what you're cutting. Yeah. What is FFP3? If I knew what the abbreviation stands for, I would tell you. But what I can say is that they are special masks with filters. They trap the dust. So it's, it's um, literally on the nose and mouth. Um, traps the dust uh, from um, you inhaling it. Okay? But what that means, what that means is that what it shouldn't mean is because you've got an FFP3 plus, you should basically walk into a cloud of dust. It's just like saying I've got an airbag in my car. That doesn't give you the license to bomb the M1 at 20 miles an hour. Clearly it doesn't. Despite the airbag, again, it requires that the operative works with, you know, safety in mind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, method statement. This is very important because sometimes it is people do not know how to get the job done safely. They have done it in the past for many years, but there are techniques that make sure that you get the job done safer as opposed to doing it anyway, okay? So, the other one that we can write down here is dermatitis. The reason why I'm breaking it down like this is that multiple choice questions can come from this side, that side, and that side, either level one or CSCS. So, rather than talking through it, break it down, you could actually see with your own eyes where questions potentially come from. Dermatitis is um, skin irritation, okay? Uh, skin irritation, stroke inflammation. And that risk is born of, from what hazard, what is typically the hazard that would lead to this risk. What's your mouth? Sorry. So materials, chemicals in materials. That is the hazard. Chemicals in materials. And the example you've just given, wet cement, okay? It is cement. Doesn't even have to be wet. It's cement, okay? That's an example of material that can potentially lead to the risk of skin irritation or um, inflammation, okay? But then the risk assessment ought to have identified the controls here, which will reduce the consequences of this hazard. And let's go through them. One of them is the PPE, okay, gloves. Right. The other is a method statement, okay. Then the other one, um, barrier cream. Barrier cream to a small extent. Why is it not wise to use barrier cream on its own? Because it can break down. Because it can be broken down by some of the chemicals in the um, materials. That's a question that has come in CSCS before. Okay, and you probably want to look at um, what we call the Quash assessment. Okay, the Quash assessment. Do we know what Quash stands for? Quash, yeah, is a 2002 regulation to do with chemicals. Okay, it's control of substances hazardous to health, okay? Control, for C, O, for O, substances, for S, hazardous, from hazard, then you add O, U, S at the end, hazardous to health, okay? Um, the Health and Safety uh, at Work Act came up with this regulation in 2002, after realizing that the materials, the chemicals in the materials were causing havoc to 
many operatives over time. So they had to create an awareness towards the operatives of the chemicals that are in the materials and how to best use them. You can imagine 50 years ago, not many people were aware of what was in cement. Or 40 years ago, it's just cement, you just use it. You don't have the awareness that this stuff that burns you, so you don't place that much emphasis or importance in wearing gloves. You just get on with the job, it's just like mixing dust or, or soil. But with this awareness, because they discovered people were getting all these side effects, they said, let's create an awareness. If we put any chemicals in the materials, let's highlight what the dangers are. If you go to a pharmacist, or if you get, you get a particular medication, you get to see what is in there and likely side effects. They will actually tell you, if you have these conditions, best to see your doctor first. Now it is on the packaging. 50 years ago, it wasn't. You simply take paracetamol and you're thinking, why do I have a tummy ache? You don't know. So because of that, it is now part of the regulation for every manufacturer to, extreme, to list down on the packaging what is in there, what can, can potentially do to your skin or your health, and how best to deal with it. This has gone as far as food. Now, you go to the supermarket, and if you buy a sandwich, they'll tell you not just the calories that are in there, but what has been used to make that sandwich. And they tell you that if you are allergic to X, Y, Z, don't eat it. In the past, you have a sandwich, and then your skin goes funny, you're thinking, what on earth happened to me? So this regulation, COSH, has been modified in other industries as well, to make sure that every chemical in the materials is describe and what needs to be done to make sure people use it safely and also store it safely. So that's what COSH regulation stands for. And that's its relevance in preventing the risk of dermatitis. Is that clear? You won't forget COSH, will you? At least that one you won't. Okay, let's look at two more. Um, I'm going to take this off. The fourth deal that we're going to look at, not in any particular order, is what we call um, hand arm vibration. Hand arm vibration syndrome. Also known as <coughs> this one here. Also known as Vibration white finger. Okay? And what is the hazard here? Um, vibrating tools. Yeah, exposure to vibrating power tools. That is the hazard. Um, what are the controls here? Holding it less tight, holding it not too tight and for sure periods of time. Absolutely. Not holding equipment to Not holding the equipment too tightly, regular breaks. The method statement actually does describe the best way to do the job safely. Okay. It does tell you how best to, uh, and also the equipment itself now has got timers. These days, the equipment will actually stop you uh, from carrying on because it will time you out. Some equipment has got that. So, um, and also, not every pair of gloves is going to be helpful. There are specific gloves for power tools. They've got thick pads in there that can take some of the absorption of the vibrating um, stuff and equipment. And obviously in CSCS, they'll ask you questions like, 
why is it not advisable to smoke while using uh, vibrating tools? Yes. Because you're gonna um, make bigger the blocks the flow of blood. It yeah. affects your blood circulation. Okay, that's why it shouldn't be it's advisable not to. Okay, um, and what is the characteristic of a uh, hand um, vibration syndrome? What characteristic? This one is the same as Parkinson. No, Parkinson is pretty much more to do with the um, nervous system, whereas um, hand and vibration, yeah, it's similar because it's tingling in your fingers. It's straight the nerves or so. Yeah, it's loss of sensation at the tips of your fingers, and they change pigmentation, either to pale uh, or a lighter color, okay? And it gets progressively worse and extends to the arms. So it has similar characteristics, but it differs a little bit, okay? Because that's a question that might come in your CSCS, right? Sorry? You've seen the question before? Yeah. Today? Yeah. yeah. In the booklet. In the booklet. Yeah, exactly. And let's look at the fifth one, which also has about three or four questions, both in your level one and your CSCS. And that is what we call lung cancer. Okay. This area is very much examined in CSCS and level one. Okay, this one, lung cancer. Okay. And the hazard is exposure to asbestos. Okay. Exposure to asbestos. Right? Um, there are three types of asbestos, white, blue, and brown. All types of asbestos can cause lung cancer doesn't stipulate which one or not. And there are other illnesses that are as a result of asbestos that are potentially going to come in your CSCS and not level one. And I think you've heard of this thing called asbestosis, okay? Or mesothelioma, okay? That can be a question in your level uh, CSCS. Your level one will have questions like in the event you are working on site and you see a material that looks like asbestos, what should you do? No, no way. <laughs> Before you tell your supervisor what you do. Oh, everyone around you. Oh. Before you tell everybody around you what you do. No, no way. You stop working. Sorry? Immediately you stop work. Yeah. You stop work. Stop work immediately. Before you warn others, you stop. You look after your safety first. Okay? That's the first question. Or the other question could be, um, within a building, where are you likely to find asbestos? That's a common question. In a roof. Roof, yes. Where else? Can you be uh, and a building you know, uh, 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 built before 2000. But you're confusing the question. I asked a different question. Yeah. Within the building, what? where are you likely to find asbestos? On the roof. The On the roof. What else? Maybe some of the ceilings. Ceiling boards. Yeah. Ceiling boards. Sorry, too close. The other way. Absolutely. Yeah, that's better. Um, on the roof. Pipe lagging, cladding, some textured coatings where you're going to find asbestos, insulation, boilers for some. That's some of the areas within the building that you're likely to find asbestos. So pipe lagging, cladding, roofs, um, insulation, insulation and some boilers, um, you're going to find asbestos. Then the other question could be, what type of building are you likely to find asbestos in? Yeah, building for, uh, which is the buildings, which is the answer you gave, buildings before the year 2000. That were built before the year 2000. 
and then the word is where you are likely to find asbestos. It doesn't mean that every old building has got asbestos, but the chances are high in those buildings as well. Those three questions are very common when it comes to asbestos. Okay? Um, it is nine minutes to eleven. Yeah? I'm gonna let us have a break. Can we be back for eleven? Is that okay? Is that enough time for you guys to stretch your legs and have a cup of tea? What, 10 minutes? Yeah. No, we've got 15 minutes. Okay, 5 past 11. Yeah? 5 past 11 is there. Okay, no.